Welcome to Simply by Grace, a podcast of Grace Life Ministries with founder and director, Dr. Charlie Bing. This podcast and other helpful resources can be found at our website, gracelife.org. Now, here's Dr. Bing. So I grew up in a large denominational church, uh, was taught the Bible stories and some Bible verses, uh, but never really under it just never got a hold of me or I never understood the message as clearly as I should have and lived with this uncertainty about whether I would go to heaven or not. Would usually say the Lord's Prayer before I went to sleep every night, whether I was sober or not. Um grew up in the sixties also. I'll let Bruce Bruce's testimony uh uh uh, substitute for mine also because we who grew up in the 60s got into all kinds of crazy stuff and we'll just leave it at that uh, but I, I got saved when I was 19 years old when someone shared the gospel of grace with me and um, just helped me to understand what John 3:16 and other verses meant when it promised eternal life and um, I just got an insatiable appetite for the Bible I lived near Washington Bible College so I said well I'll take a couple classes there and just get some of my questions answered Long story short, that just turned into uh, you know, four or five years there and graduated from Washington Bible College. And then a lot of the books were written by professors at the uh, Dallas Seminary. So I had a great deal of respect for that seminary. And I decided to go to Dallas Seminary as a result of that and uh, stretched that into 11 years of education there, two degrees. So in the meantime, while I'm at seminary, I'm helping uh, to start a couple new churches um, and then actually started Burleson Bible Church in 1986. I stayed there for um, 19 years and stepped down from that almost three years ago. About three years ago, I told them I was stepping down, much to their surprise because everything was going fine. And uh, I still go there, by the way. And just because uh, I had a real passion to get the grace message out. And so about 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, I started Grace Life Ministries, which is uh, was my way of producing literature and and doing some missions projects and things like that, uh, where people were interested in, in helping do these things outside the church, it was easier to start it apart from the church. With the church's blessing, started Grace Life Ministries. And what we do is we share the gospel of grace with the unsaved and the grace of the gospel with the saved. I'll let you figure out what that means. We share, <laughs> you know, I always get somebody that says, say that again. We share the gospel of grace with the unsaved. Because unsaved people need to understand that salvation is a free gift. And we share the grace of the gospel with the saved. Because Christians everywhere are really inconsistent in how they then live out that grace and apply that grace to their Christian lives. So uh, usually it's in other countries where we're sharing the gospel of grace with the unsaved. And usually it's in America where I'm sharing the grace of the gospel with the saved. But that's what we do. We produce literature and we go on trips. I just recently got back from India, and uh, we're preparing for a trip for Africa, and uh, then do conference ministries in the United States and trying to always put out some new tools and resources that really um, keep the message clear and help spread that message around the world. I've been a part of what what is called the Grace Movement since its very beginning. It was at the very first meeting um, for the Grace Evangelical Society and served on their board and uh, been to all their conferences. And um, uh, and their, their you know their goal is a, is mainly a theological goal uh, to define um, the grace message. Uh, but the Free Grace Alliance uh, we felt needed to get that message out, and so we found ways to get that message out. So um, uh, that's where we are today. And um, I'm currently the president, but I'll rotate off. We have a rotating leadership, and that's by design and strategy. We think it's a good idea. So that's a little bit about my background. Eternal security is a real essential part of the gospel message. It's very central to our message, and you'll see why as we go through our discussion of it. When we talk about the gift, we're talking about a gift that God doesn't take back. And that's a very important concept. So let's let's talk about secured by grace. Eternal security is a big issue in the church in America. When you leave America, it's not really a big issue because nobody believes in it. That's what I found. My wife was uh, had befriended someone, and she was sharing her testimony with them as they walked around the neighborhood. And she said she told them how she told her how she was gloriously saved in this church, 
And for about six months, she was just like on cloud nine floating around. She was so happy. Her life was just totally different. She saw everything differently. She was just rejoicing in the gift of eternal life. And then she says she went to church one day, and this little old lady came up to her and said, well, you better be careful, though. You can lose it. And she said her attitude just went, Meow, because now she didn't know if she had it forever. And what? how could I lose it? And how do I know it when I've lost it? You think it made a difference to her? I just got back from India. And for it, to make a long story short, somehow the past, uh, there's a pastor, a leader of pastors over there who had gotten a hold of uh, my, my book, Lordship Salvation, and my other book, Living in the Family of Grace, which goes through the book of Romans, essentially, and talks about these issues. And uh, he had gotten a hold of them, I think through somebody who had gone over and worked in an orphanage, and, and he started to teach his 200 pastors from them. And uh, then he wrote, emailed me uh, a year and a half ago. And he said, you know, I really like your books, and I'm teaching them to my pastors, 200 pastors. But I think it would be better if you came over and taught. I think you could teach them better than, than I. So we, we corresponded. I get a lot of invitations, but I like to know a lot more before I commit myself to anything. And I actually was able to check him out through some people in America who knew him and things like that. To make a long story short again, he said, you come over here, and I, I, I think there will be 400 pastors for you to train. The 200 that I train regularly, but others will hear and they'll come. And our church will hold 400. But if we have to, he said, we'll knock the wall down in our church for more to fit in. Well, luckily, we just went over in January, uh, brought someone with me, and they didn't have to knock the wall down because they had just about 400, and every seat was filled in the church. And I taught 400 pastors and took them basically through my workbook, which is the Book of Romans. I just taught the Book of Romans to them. And, of course, Romans is logically laid out very carefully about how we're in sin and how we're justified, how we're to to apply that grace in our, our sanctification, and we have a new power. And then we have security in chapter 8. In chapters 9 through 11, it's part of God's plan for the whole world. And then chapters 12 and on is how we can serve him. And the pastor saw this and understood that, and they rejoiced. His own words to me were uh, that, that he has found his eternal security for the first time in his life. And he told me, he said, when I look in the mirror, it's just like looking at a different person. Now, this is a pastor who's been a pastor almost all of his adult life. He's in his mid to upper 40s, and he's just rejoicing. And he, he says, when I share it with my people, they rejoice. And, and now these 200 pastors, he says, I'm getting all kinds of comments, and I didn't. he's translating a lot for me because uh, we had to use translation. Uh, but he says they're rejoicing in their eternal salvation. They have a lot of questions, but, but you've convinced a lot of them of their eternal salvation. Did it make a difference to them? Absolutely. I've taught the idea of eternal security in Africa, and I, I've actually seen people pop out of their seats. They're more animated than the Indians. They actually pop out of their seats with a big smile on their face when they get it. It's like they're sitting there like that. I've actually seen the physical reaction in them. And, and when I talk to people in the States, they tell me it's like being born again all over again. It is such a relief and security to have that issue settled. And your testimonies are probably like that. But anyway, let's talk about this issue secured by grace. The doctrine of eternal security uh, states that a person who has obtained eternal life, that is someone who's become a Christian through faith in Jesus Christ, cannot forfeit eternal life because of what he or she does or does not do. Okay, that's being consistent with grace. If it's a free gift that we receive, then and we don't have to do anything to get eternal life, then there's nothing we can do to keep eternal life. Our eternal life depends on God's promise and not our performance. But you know that there's a great controversy about eternal security uh, in the church and around the world. And let's talk a little bit about why some people may not believe in eternal security. Well, some people say it encourages sin. Have you ever heard that? Um, you know, because I know Baptists traditionally have believed in this, so you maybe have taught this to someone and they say, oh, once saved, always saved. Yeah, you can just go do whatever you want to. You've heard that? Somebody can just live however they want to. I got my ticket to heaven, is what they would say. And they, it would breed an um, irresponsible lifestyle. Well, that would be their argument. But you know what? If you've ever got that argument, don't feel too badly, because it's the exact argument Paul got in Romans 6, right? And so I tell people, unless you're being criticized for teaching license, you're probably not preaching the gospel of grace. Because when you preach the gospel of grace and people understand it, they'll often accuse you of license exactly what they did 
with the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6. They say, well, it wouldn't be fair. It's not fair to guarantee eternal security to someone who hasn't lived uh, for God, who's lived a life of sin. Well, my, my response is, what is fair? It's not fair that we got saved in the first place. We want to talk about fair? Uh, it's never, grace is never fair. You remember the parable of the workers? One worked all day and one work came in at the last hour. They all got paid the same thing. And the master said, who are, you know, hey, I'm the master. I can determine what I pay people. You know, we, it, it's, it's, uh, grace is not fair. Uh, and then people say, well, there's a lot of Bible verses that say we can lose our salvation. Now, here's where we can really get tangled up because people will cite, what about this verse? Hebrews 6. And then you'll answer that. And then they'll say, what about this verse? Galatians 5, 4. And then we'll get tangled up in that. And what about Colossians 1, 21 through 23? And it's just on and on. It's just a long string of verses that they'll have that they say proves you can lose your salvation. And you're put in the position of having to defend each one. And I don't think that's the best tactic to use, so I'll explain a little bit later, more later. But what we need to help them understand is that some of those verses may be speaking about God's discipline. While it is true that once we are saved, we cannot be unsaved, God, and once we are in God's family, we're forever in God's family, God does not let his children run wild. And that's what Hebrews 12 is saying. He said God chastises those whom he loves like a father does his son. If you're walking through the Walmart store, if I'm walking through the Walmart store and you and you see me walking by a boy and he knocks over a, a stack of boxes and I just keep walking on, what's your conclusion? Not my boy. But if I go over there and grab his arm or give him a little swat or say some words of rebuke to him, uh, you, you would immediately conclude that he's my son and I'm doing something out of my love for him. So God's chastisement according to the author of Hebrews, is one of the proofs that we are his children because God doesn't let his children run wild. So uh, can we do whatever we want? Well, to the theoretical and theological level, yes. But God does that doesn't mean there's not going to be consequences. And some of these verses that people quote also could be speaking of e losing eternal rewards, not eternal salvation. There are many passages here. We'll talk about them this afternoon. But, for example, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, it talks about one's works that are burned by fire. Sometimes whenever anybody reads that word fire, they immediately want to jump to the conclusion that it refers to hell. Or when it talks about losing a race or losing a reward, people think that could be referring to losing salvation. Uh, but we're going to show this afternoon that there's a whole other category that people rarely consider, and that is losing your rewards, not your eternal salvation. So we will be held accountable for how we live our lives. And then there are some verses that could be speak of losing our fellowship with God. Not losing our salvation, but our fellowship with God. Again, many passages here. But take Psalm 51 as an example. After David sinned so grievously with Bathsheba and Uriah, he, he cries out this psalm that makes him look like an unsaved man almost. He says, return to me the joy of my salvation. But if you look carefully, he's not saying return to me my salvation. Return to me the joy of of my salvation. He lost that joy of intimate fellowship that he had with God. I think that's what the first, the whole book of 1 John really is about. It's about keeping that fellowship with God, not keeping your salvation. So we have to un help them understand that there's a different way of looking at these passages. Some of the other passages could be speaking of physical death. Not every time we read the word death in the Bible does it speak of eternal death. And um, 1 Corinthians 11 is an example of the Lord's Supper being. Um, misobserved, observed in the wrong way. And Paul says, because of that, uh, some of you are sick and some of ha have even fallen asleep or died. And the Bible does teach that there is a sin unto death in James 5 and 1 John 5. So a Christian can, can push the limits. I could give you examples from personal experiences with people who were genuinely saved beyond any doubt I had for their salvation. I mean, I know they were saved. They witnessed to me. And yet they went back to an old lifestyle and God, God took their physical lives, I would say, through circumstances. And, you know, I can only see that as a gracious thing because God kept them from losing all of their rewards. God kept them from losing all of their testimony. So uh, God can do that. That's one of his disciplinary things he can do.
And we shouldn't jump to the conclusion that, that those verses are referring to hell, which is what some people do. Why do some people like me believe in eternal security? Well, because of grace, because of my understanding of what grace is all about. Now, remember that grace applies to all of salvation, too. It's not just our initial justification, but when we see grace, it applies to our growth and sanctification and then our ultimate glorification, which is the guarantee of our being in God's presence. Grace teaches us not to sin. Now, quite contrary to those who say grace teaches us we can do whatever we want to, Paul's argument in Romans 6 is that, no, you have a new master and a new motive, and you should serve God with your freedom. Titus 2, 11 through 14, through the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, unrighteousness, we should live a godly life in this world, something like that. We don't live a godly life and then receive the grace of God. We receive the grace of God and it teaches us. The sequence in those verses is very, very clear. So we don't require people to clean up their lives so that they can be saved by some kind of uh, misconstrued grace. We teach people that God brings them in and then cleans them up. Grace motivates us to live for God. I think that's very clear from the book of Romans and the way it's designed. But when we come to chapters 12, 1 and 2, what do we read? Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercies. In other words, because of everything I've said for 11 chapters to you, I urge you now to offer your bodies a living sacrifice. And then he goes on to tell how you can love people, how you can use your gifts, how you can honor your government authorities and how you can love and accept those who are weaker in the faith and, and many other things. But the point of the structure of Romans is such a good argument for talking to people about what grace means before we tell them what to do to live for God. And how contrary that is to the model of so many churches all around us who, when you, when you come, the, the message you typically get is, well, you got to do this, 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 you got to do this. And there are definitely things people need to do, but before we talk about what someone needs to do to serve God, we need to be sure they understand who they are because that's what motivates them. So 11 chapters of motivation before Paul says the first thing they really need to do. And it's the same way in Galatians. He's got four chapters of theology, two chapters of conduct. Ephesians, three chapters of who you are. Three chapters of how you should walk, right? Colossians, two chapters of who Jesus is and who you are in him and complete in him. Two chapters of how to apply that to your wife, children, employers, and so forth. That's a good lesson and a side sermon for us about how to teach the Bible and motivations for a godly life. Help people understand who they are. Grace motivates us to live that way out of appreciation for him. And then my answer again is grace is never fair. And that goes back to Romans 5, 15 through 19, where we, we read about death coming into the world through one man's sin, but righteousness also through one man's act of obedience, Jesus Christ. If it's not fair that he would save us, then it's not, and it, it, it's not fair that we would be called sinners. It's not fair that he would save us, but what is fair? God has... God has condemned us because of Adam's sin, but he saved us because of Christ's work. And grace covers all sin. Uh, that's what grace means. In Romans 5.20, he talks uh, about um, how where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Grace superabounds. In other words, we can't out -sin God's grace. God's grace covers the worst thing that we've ever done. Better than that, God's grace covers the worst thing we will ever do, because we have yet to see that, probably. And that's what Colossians 2, 13 through 14 is saying. He says we, he has forgiven us all of our sins. Now, if grace is covering us past, present, and future, we tend to think of grace that has saved us from our past sins. And when I, we, I came to know Jesus Christ, and I was forgiven for 19 years of sin. That's my perspective, but what is God's perspective? When Jesus died on the cross, how many of my sins were future to him? All of them, right? So 
Jesus knew what I was also going to do today. And he also knew what I'm going to do tomorrow and how I'm going to mess up tomorrow. Right? And yet he died on the cross anyway and gave me eternal life anyway. And nothing I do tomorrow, even though I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow, I hope I'll stay faithful, but nothing I do tomorrow is going to surprise him or make him say, why did I save Charlie Bing? I shouldn't have done that. But God saved us anyway, even though he knows what you're doing today and what you're going to do tomorrow. So grace has covered all of our sin. There's no surprises, and that's why we can say our eternal life is secure. And God's grace is, good. Grace is God's consistent attitude towards all mankind. I'm just thinking on the macro level. The whole story, the whole Bible, and Romans 9-11 through 11 is an example of this, how God had a purpose for Israel. And even though Israel was disobedient, Israel one day is going to be saved, 1126. So God had a purpose that is not going to be thwarted. And he says that after he talks about our individual situation, that we've all been saved, sanctified, glorified, and secured in his grace in Romans chapter 8. And then he says, by the way, you fit into just a bigger piece of the puzzle, what I'm doing for the whole world. So if God's purpose for Israel is not going to be thwarted, then your place in that plan is not going to be thwarted either. Because you're part of a bigger, global, universal plan of God. See, grace is not, doesn't just start in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, or Romans 3. Grace starts back in Genesis as soon as man fell. And God provided for his needs. And God promised a redeemer, a seed, a descendant who would come and oppose Satan and crush his head. And provide for our salvation. And then grace continued with Abraham and a covenant he made with him where he said, I will give you a make you a great nation. I will give you land and I will make you a blessing to the whole world. And grace continued through Abraham and his sons, Isaac and Jacob. And grace preserved the nation under Joseph. And then and then through the terrible period of the judges, there was always a remnant of grace. And then grace continued into the monarchy uh, with King David, who would be a king. Someone would come like King David and sit on his throne forever. And then in the new covenant, the Jeremiah and Ezekiel. I mean, grace is not something that begins in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's God's whole plan. It always has been. So grace is God's consistent attitude towards all mankind. This is what I think people have trouble understanding sometimes, and they want to, to think that God is not that generous. But yet in 1 Peter 5, 10, uh, 1 Peter 5, 10, he's called the God of all grace. That's what characterizes him. And it's hard for people to believe sometimes, but God really does want everyone to be saved. He has made the, the provision for everyone to be saved. He wants as many to be saved as will believe. He doesn't want to put obstacles in the way. He doesn't want to make salvation difficult or complicated. He wants to make it as simple as he can because he wants people to be in his family. And so he's made a simple condition, faith in what he's done for us. And that's been the simple condition all through his plan and purpose and history for the world. So simple a child can understand it. So simple we can communicate that cross-culturally. So simple that the dumbest of us can understand it, the most skeptical of us can understand it. But God really does want people to be saved. But yet there are some people who act like God is really looking for any opportunity to stamp us out because heaven has an exclusive membership. And there's not many of us getting there. And so if you mess up, you're not getting in there. I don't know where that motivation comes from. It sounds like it could be pride. But that's often the way Christianity is presented. Well, let's look at one passage together. You might turn to Romans chapter 8 with me. Let's look at what grace teaches about eternal security in Romans 8. It is definitely taught in many places. But I like chapter 28 because he really uses it as a climax to his whole argument for grace in the book of Romans. If you want to learn about grace, I think Romans is the book to go to because it's used there more times than any other place in the New Testament. The word grace is used 36 times. It's his consistent theme from the beginning to the end of the book. And he builds this case that we're, we're totally lost in our sin and can't do anything to save ourselves. Then chapter 3 breaks open with a big promise. But now God, 
has revealed his righteousness through the gospel to all who will believe in Jesus Christ freely by his grace. He goes on to explain. He explains justification and how it is totally by grace. And then he goes on and shows how your sanctification is also by grace with a new power and a new person. And, uh, and how that's how we overcome the flesh, chapter 7 and chapter 8. All the benefits of, of that justification brings is the power of the Holy Spirit, a new life, the life of Christ in us, his resurrection life. But by the, by the time we come to the end of Romans 28, he's summing up his argument for what grace has done for us. And I just love the eloquence here and how he does that. And he does it actually, uh, starts in verse 28, I think where he says in our very well-known verse, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, this verse is often used to uh, comfort people in a time of trouble. But the way Paul is really using it is to show us that God, there's nothing that can keep us from a God accomplishing his purpose in us. And what is that purpose in us? Verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. God's purpose for us is to be conformed to Jesus Christ. That was his foreordained purpose for us. We won't get into a discussion of, of predestination and foreknowledge and things like that. I think there's there's truth to that. I don't know how it works with my will, but God has God does, and I'll find out somewhat someday. But God knew that Charlie Bing would be saved, and he and he wanted me to be conformed to the image of His Son. But the way He was going to accomplish that was that He was going to extend a call or an invitation to me, and then I would have to be justified through faith in Christ. But if I was justified, it says all those who are justified will be glorified. And so in God's eternal purpose for me, not only was my justification or initial salvation seen, but also my glorification was as good as accomplished in God's mind. Now, you and I tend to think of things in linear terms, don't we, on our timeline. God doesn't see things that way. We see one, one float after another in the parade. God sees the whole parade from beginning to end. We look through a knot hole in a fence. He's looking at it from a hilltop. You see? So when he saved Charlie Bing, again, his grace covered the beginning of my life to the end of my life. And that's what he's saying here. This chain is not broken. And when God puts me in that parade, he knows I'm going to finish it by his grace. It's interesting that he doesn't use that word sanctification in here. He just goes from justification. All those who are justified will be glorified. Because our sanctification has different degrees. We may not be much sanctified, but yet we'll be glorified undeservingly. But we have to cooperate with him in that sanctification process. But justification through faith in Christ guarantees that we will be glorified in him. And his purpose for us cannot be broken. And then God's favor towards us cannot be denied. Paul begins to ask a series of questions. His first, in verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. He's saying that there's no power anywhere that can deny us what God has promised us. God's favor towards us cannot be thwarted or denied. He gives us the whole package. I think the argument here that he's using in verses 31 through 32 is that if God gave the most precious, valuable thing to accomplish his purpose, that would be Jesus, his son, won't he give us everything else that we need? Doesn't that make sense? Why would he give his most precious thing and not finish what his son set out to accomplish with us? That would be a waste of the death of his son. If I really wanted, let's say you really wanted to, to visit me, but you say, you know, I don't have a penny in my pocket. I don't have anything. Let's say I had the means. And I wish I did, but I would say, okay, I'll buy you a car. Come visit me. Well, you say, well, I don't have gas money. I say, I'll buy you gas. If I'm going to buy you a car, am I not going to buy you a tank of gas to get where you're going? If God is going to give his son Jesus Christ, won't he give everything else 
and overcome every other obstacle, obstacle in our way to be sure that we are glorified the way he intended. I think that's what Paul is saying here. God's favor towards us cannot be denied. God's justification of us cannot be reversed. He says in verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Now, of course, the word justification is a legal term. It comes from the courtroom scene in that day. And uh, it meant to be, uh, pre- be released from the penalties of your crime. To be de- declared legally in the eyes of the law acquitted of that charge. Now, if God is the God and the judge of all the universe, and he justifies us or declares us uh, acquitted and released from our crimes, who can reverse that charge? And just as in America, with God, there's no double jeopardy. And so O.J. Simpson can write a book where he almost confesses to what, he's, what he did, and um, he knows he, he'll never have to be tried for that again. Many countries don't have that, and when I try to explain that to them, they look at them, they, I say, that's the way we do it in America, and they look at me like we're crazy. Sometimes I think we are, but there's a reason for it, I guess. But that's the way it is in God's court. If God has declared us justified, who can bring any other charges against us? God's dropped the charges because Jesus paid the price. And then God's uh, Christ's intercession for us cannot be ineffective. He says in verse 34, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Again, the scene is more of a courtroom in the context. Nobody can bring any charge that condemns us because Christ is our intercessor. He makes intercession for us. That is a word that was used of someone who was like a defense attorney, an advocate. Someone who pleads your case. You have Jesus Christ as an advocate before God. That's pretty good news, isn't it? Because Jesus doesn't lose his cases. You know, uh, these days, to not lose your case, you have to spend a lot of money to get the best lawyers, and they'll figure out somehow to make the guilty innocent. Jesus has never lost a case. And so Satan, the accuser, stands before God, and he says, Did you see what Charlie Bing did? He doesn't deserve to get to heaven. He's still doing the he's still doing some wrong things. And Jesus says, says, Father, I knew that when I saved Charlie, and I saved him anyway, and I've paid the price for all of his sins. So Satan's got to go back and think of something else. So are you listening more to Satan or are you listening more to your advocate, your intercession, your high priest who lives before God forever? interceding for us according to Hebrews 7.25. I'm glad I'm on his team or he's on my team. Christ's love for us can never be separated from us. This is kind of Paul's conclusion to his argument for our security. It begins in verse 35 and the language just gets loftier and loftier and more climactic. But look what he says. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Is there anyone, anywhere, and that would include myself and my my own feelings, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And he quotes the Old Testament about those who have suffered and were killed for their faith. For your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Do these things separate us from God's love or keep us from his salvation? And look at the things that he lists, tribulation or hard times. Sometimes when we're going through a real difficult time, we say, boy, I think God's given up on me. You've forgotten about me. I don't know if I'm in his family. I must not be saved because no saved person could go through this kind of trouble, one after another, after another, after another. I'm familiar with a situation in our church where a woman had very difficult family experience, very difficult church experience, very difficult marriage experience, then her son gets hit by a car and dies a year later, and now her 14-year-old daughter is uh, has Terrible, terrible case of cancer. Now, someone like that, she has not done this, but someone like that could say, I can't be a child of God and be treated like this. So, do tribulations separate us from the love of God? And then he goes on and talks about distress or persecution. 
when we're when we're persecuted, people are saying things about us. We tend to get this attitude of, well, you know, could they be right? Or you know, am I? They're saying I'm from Satan, or they're saying I'm not saved. You know how church arguments can get. Even uh, does that mean it's true? Or when you don't have enough food to eat, doesn't God promise that He'd always provide for our needs? But I'm I'm so hungry, I don't have enough food or clothes. Even would God let His children live like this? Or go through this dangerous time or through this, this time of warfare where we're being killed and people are watching their families be killed. Would God let me go through this? I must not be a Christian. I must not be in his family after all. That could be a conclusion. But Paul's asking the question, is that going to separate us from the love of God? But in verse 37, he says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors to him who loved us. We're not only in God's eyes, above our circumstances, but we're more than conquerors. The victory's already been won. It's not just that we're winning, we've won. Because all those who are justified will be glorified. No matter what we go through in this life, our, our end, our outcome is determined in God's plan that we will be conformed to the image of His Son. And then he says, in this grand summary, which I love in, in verse 38, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, whether I'm alive now or life, it, 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 anything in the future, nor angels or principalities or powers, any spiritual power, nor things present nor things to come, you know, anything that's happening now or anything that's going to happen, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul couldn't express himself more thoroughly when he says, there's nothing, nowhere, no one that can ever get me out of the grip of God's love. Amen. What a comforting thought that is. Does the Bible teach eternal security? Well, duh. I was talking to somebody just the other day. Um, up in the Greensboro area, and uh, they were thinking about going to this church. I said, well, you know, that church doesn't, they think, you, they teach that you can lose your salvation. And she said, well, don't they read the Bible? <laughs> it, it's uh, there for me, you know. But we admit that there are passages that are hard to interpret. And Romans 8, to me, is just the, the sparkle and the diamond and the ring in the jewelry box of God's arguments for uh, eternal security. And, and Paul just seems to be looking down from the mountaintop uh, or, or giving us a mountaintop experience of grace by the, the time we get there. And uh, this is where I usually see people who haven't been taught eternal security just starting to wiggle with joy is when we get to Romans chapter 8. But there are a lot of other arguments uh, that we could go through if we took the time. We could argue from the meaning of eternal life itself, for example. Eternal life means eternal. It's not temporary life. It's not interrupted life. But eternal life means God's life. It's not just life in terms of length. It's life in terms of quality and relationship. That's how it's defined in John 17, 3. This is eternal life, that you may know God and the one that he's sent. So eternal life means that God's life has been infused in you. And since it is God's life, it cannot be lost. And, and because it's eternal in nature also, it is not interrupted. And if it is not really eternal, then we need to call it something else because we've misnamed it. So there's the whole meaning of eternal life. And then there's the um, argument that God cannot lie. It just goes as simply as this, that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will not perish but have everlasting life. Now, that's a promise that God made. But does God keep his promises or not? Titus says God does not lie. When talking about the security of the nation of Israel, in Romans chapter 3, Paul says, let, every, let God be true and every man a liar. It doesn't matter what we say. It doesn't matter what Israel does. It doesn't matter what you do. God's promise is going to hold true because God keeps his words. It doesn't matter what Abraham did. God keeps his promises to Abraham. It doesn't matter what David did. God keeps his promises to David. And it doesn't matter what you do. God keeps his promises to you if you have believed him for that promise because he cannot lie. Another argument would be God's double grip. You know this familiar passage in John 10 where Jesus talks about his sheep and he says, 
you're in my hand and I'm in my father's hand. And so God's got this double grip. And he says, so none of you, that's why he says, none of you will perish. That's a pretty good grasp, pretty good grip there. Other biblical arguments would be the significance of new birth. We know that we must be born again, that we've become children of God. Can someone who is born into a family be unborn? That would just be unnatural. So the new birth indicates that there's a new life there. Uh, a life can die, but it can never be denied that there ever was life. Uh, and uh, a person cannot be unborn. And likewise, the significance of adoption, or maybe I should have said the finality of adoption. God has adopted us into his family. We're no longer slaves, but sons. He's not going to turn his sons back into slaves. But now we, our spirits cry out and identify with him as Abba, Daddy, Father. No longer do we cower before him in fear, and he'll never put us back under that. That's the argument of Romans and Galatians. So there's the whole significance and finality of adoption. Remember the significance of the spirit's sealing. There's a couple passages that talk about how we're sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. It's God's guarantee or his word. The word really means a down payment. The idea of, of sealing has to do with the idea of, of security. In that day when something was sealed, it was not to be opened until it reached its destination. Much like maybe I think a certified letter today that someone has to sign for. It's guaranteed to get there and it cannot be opened until that person receives it and signs for it. And God has sealed us with his Holy Spirit, and that seal cannot be broken until our day of redemption, our day of going to be with him. Now, there's many other lines of arguments that we could use to show eternal security is taught in the scriptures. Well, what are some implications of this idea of eternal security? Well, first, it is central to the free grace message. We can't teach grace as a gift of God, and say, well, but God may take his gift back. That would just undo everything we're trying to do. And so we in the Free Grace Alliance, it's part of our covenant, and, and I know our beliefs is that uh, when we are saved by God, there's nothing, if we're saved by his grace, there's nothing that we do or don't do that can lose that salvation. It's central to the gospel message because that grace is not just applied to justification, it's applied to sanctification as well as glorification. And it's a major motivation to godly living. I really believe that, that to get people established and motivated in godly living, we have to settle the issue of, of whether they can lose their salvation or not. Otherwise, what happens is people get lost in their assurance uh, or lack of assurance or their introspection, or their doubt and fears. And instead of being motivated under God's freedom to serve him, they're motivated more by fear, I have to do the right thing. And they lose their joy. I, can't say, I always say you can't go forward when you're always looking backwards. Always looking backwards and say, well, was I really saved? Am I really saved? That's not a good environment or, or atmosphere for Christian growth and maturity. It's the basis for assurance of salvation. If you don't believe in eternal security, if you believe that salvation can be lost, then you really can never be fully sure that you're saved. One reason is simply because if there's something that you can do to lose your salvation, how do you know you haven't done it? Where is that definitive list of things in the Bible that says this will take your salvation away? Well, some people will point to a list, you know, that has murder in it. And I say, well, it also says oh, disobeying your parents. <laughs> well, they'll point to a list that has homosexuality in it. And I'll say, well, it also says pride. So where is the definitive list that says you will lose your salvation over that sin? So as long as you think you can lose it, you'll never know when and how you can lose it. And so it undermines your salvation. But when we believe in eternal security... It gives us that assurance of salvation. Now, we need to understand the difference between eternal security and assurance is this. Eternal security relates to whether or not we can lose our salvation. 
that's objective, but assurance is subjective, relates to whether or not believers can know they are saved. And I'm telling you, we have a, a big problem with assurance in our churches today. Almost any church i found, no matter how good the preachers are, there's still people who struggle with this uh, problem of lack of assurance of salvation. In some churches, it's more rampant than in others, but I've discovered it's just everywhere. People are wondering whether they're saved. I call it a problem of ADD, assurance deficit disorder. The church has it badly. So I just want to talk for a minute about uh, why do some Christians doubt their salvation? Because this is related to their the issue of eternal security. Well, I think some people don't understand grace. They don't think God's grace is big enough to cover all of their lives and all of their sins, and so they doubt their salvation. I think that some people are looking at their faith instead of at God's promise. See, they're asking questions like, well, did I really believe? Did I believe enough? Did I have the right kind of faith? Instead of looking at God's promise and Jesus' work and his person and work as the object of their faith. But what does Jesus teach about faith? He says faith the size of, size of a mustard seed will move a mountain. It's not the size of the faith. It's the object of the faith. Who is God and his promises. Who is Jesus and his work. And so, But some people have a tendency to uh, question things like, did I believe enough? Do I, is my faith strong enough? But you know, you can have strong faith and get in a leaky boat and still drown. You can have weak faith and get in a strong boat and live. So how much faith does it take to be saved? Just enough to trust in the object. And they have difficulty trusting someone. This is, this is why it's so important to have good parenting and be good parents. Uh, or be a good friend. I mean, this, this, I think some people project on God what they have learned from other relationships in life. Let me give you an example. I got a phone call one day when I was pastor and a lady was all disturbed. She says, I, I, just, I just don't know if I'm going to heaven. I just don't know if God loves me. I just want to feel like he's wrapping his arm around me and loves me, but I'm not sure I'm a Christian. And I, I went through the gospel with her, and I said, well, you understand that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and he promised you eternal life if you believe in him. Have you believed in him? Yes, I have. Well, then, well, I just don't feel like God loves me, though. I said, I've learned to ask this question. I said, well, tell me about your relationship with your father. She said, oh, my father, he was an alcoholic. He worked the late shift. He would come home at night when we'd be sleeping, and if everything wasn't just perfect, he would wake us up and start beating us. And he said, so, she said, sometimes I would wake up, and I'd be hanging by the arm, and he'd be beating me with his belt, and that's how I would wake up. He was, sometimes he'd be fine, and then other times he would just turn on us. I never knew. I said, well, maybe you're projecting. I knew it for sure. She was projecting her feelings of insecurity in that that she got from her father, her first God figure in life, to God. Is God's love just as capricious and can turn on her just like that? My friends, I'm sorry, but we do that. You grow up with an angry father, you have an angry God. You grow up with a loving father, you have a loving God. You grow up with a capricious father's love, you, you have a, a capricious God. Not all the time. That can be fixed by learning to know about your heavenly father. That's God's grace. But I know that from experience, that we project on God our first images from our parents and the other people that are close to us. So some people just have difficulty trusting someone. It may not be their parents, but others have let them down, and they've just learned not to trust anyone because they've been deceived too many times. And then there are those who have an introspective personality. These are the people who are emotion-oriented, they, they feeling-oriented, and uh, they live by their feelings. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I I'm, I thank God there are people like that in the world because they're the poets and the musicians and the ones that help me get in touch with my feelings because I'm not a very introspective person. I was telling some guys uh, the other day about a friend who went through Dallas Theological Seminary, and when he enrolled, he didn't know if he was saved or not, but that's what he intended to find out. He was going to pay all this tuition and go through seminary to find out if he was saved. And when he told me that, I said, man, I said, are, are you an introspective person? And he said, Charlie, I can draw you a map of my psyche. And I said, you know what? I didn't even know I had a psyche. I said, That's the difference. That's the difference between us. But he lived by his feelings. 
But he's overcome that. He knows he's saved. He's a great free grace guy now, pastor, uh, and, and sorted all that out. But some of you have had to deal with the lack of assurance because you don't feel like you're saved. And you've looked within and you said, I don't know if I believe the right thing. I don't know if my motives are right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The cure to that is to get outside of yourself and look at Jesus Christ and who he is and what he's promised. Some people have had a very severe trial, as I said, and that can cause them to become disillusioned. Say, does God really love me? Am I really saved? There are some who are practicing sin, Christians who are not doing what is right, and that always muddies things up. It plays with your emotions. It plays with your, plays with your understanding of God's word. When that conscience and the heavy hand of God is beating, bearing down on your, your conscience and your soul, you may not feel saved. And that's one of the way I think one of the ways I think God uh, disciplines us. But when you practice sin, it's like throwing mud into a gas <clears throat> gasoline engine. It just messes things up. And then there are some people who are confused about interpretations of the Bible. They look at a passage that may have to do with rewards or discipleship, and they say, "Boy, if that's how I'm saved, I'm not doing that." And so I wonder if I'm saved. We'll talk about those distinctions when we talk about discipleship and rewards. But assurance is a big problem. It's related to eternal security. But when we talk about eternal security, because of grace, we know that we're eternally secure. And if we cannot be saved by works, then we cannot be unsaved by works. In the end, it's all really very simple, isn't it? So what do we do? Because you're going to meet people who don't believe in eternal security. Help them focus on Jesus Christ and his promises. Who he is. Not on their feelings, not on their behavior, not on their performance, but on Jesus and his performance. We can never be good enough to be saved. We can never be good enough to deserve salvation. We can never be good enough to earn and keep salvation. Only Jesus can. And we have to shift people's focus to him. I remember reading that uh, Michael Jackson, the, the musician, or whatever we call him, um, used to be afraid to fly on airplanes, on jet planes. And so what, what one airline did was they took him on board and they, they showed him the plane, how it was built, how it worked. They showed him the instrument panels and all the fail-safe systems they had, all the security systems that they had. And, and after that, he, he got over that big obstacle of being afraid because he became more familiar with the airplane and how it works. I think people, the more we can teach them about Christ and who he is and, and that he is God, the Son, the more they'll be willing to place their faith in him and depend on him. And then ground people in grace. That's really the key, and that's why we're doing what we do. When we ground people in grace, this, the issues of eternal security fall away. The issues of assurance fall away, um, and that's what I see happening so much when I go overseas, especially where it's just rampant that they don't believe in eternal security. You teach them grace. I like to use the book of Romans and, and John. Th those two books just ground people in grace and, and sends them on their way, literally rejoicing that for, from now on, they don't have to worry about their relationship with God. And it just frees them up and makes them new people. I've seen it over and over and over again. It, serve, it frees them up so they can serve God. Back in 1937, a great project got underway in San Francisco. They were going to build a bridge across the San Francisco Bay. It's called the Golden Gate Bridge. It was the largest suspension bridge of its time. The project was earmarked with $77 million. And the... And so they began to build this bridge over the San Francisco Bay. The problem was the high winds there that would come and, and blow. And so workers were dying and getting blown off the bridge. And work proceeded at a snail's pace because people were being so careful about getting blown off the bridge and losing their lives. And then they came up with an idea. They figured it would cost only $10,000 to build a big safety net under the bridge. And so they did. And the result was that it saved 10 lives that fell off the bridge. The second result that they did not anticipate is that work proceeded 25% faster. Why? People didn't have anything to fear. 
My friends, if you really want to turn people on to serve in the church and to serve God and to live a godly life, it's not by beating them over the head with guilt and fear and insecurity and hanging them over hell. It's by telling them, hey, God loves you. He's accepted you. And there's nothing you can do to make him not love you. And man, if that doesn't motivate them, nothing will. Thank you for listening. For more resources or to help spread the message of God's life-changing grace, visit our website, at gracelife.org. We'd love to hear from you. Send us a message at simplybygrace at gracelife.org. See you next time.